So we are continuing our discussion on the measurement and sampling concepts. And for that purpose, we are going to discuss two important attributes of sampling today. The first one is random sampling. So as we know that sampling represents a population from which it is drawn. So in the previous lecture, we discussed the definition of sample that um, if the population size is large enough, if the population consists of a large number of units and members, and uh, it is not possible to take observation from each member from each unit in the population, then what we do is that we take observations from a subset, from a smaller group of the population, and that subset is known as the sample, and that represents the population from which it is drawn. So this is the definition of sample that we had discussed earlier. And to be a truly representative units in the sample, they must be drawn randomly from population, and they must be drawn in a manner which is free of any kind of bias, right? Because if we are saying that this sample is going to represent the population, then it should be a truly uh, a true representative, which means that every unit in the population, it must have an equal chance of being drawn. There should be no element of bias that favors sampling of some specific type of units in the population as compared to the others. So there should be no element of bias and to be a truly representative, every unit in the sample, they must have an equal chance of being, being drawn and they must be drawn randomly from population. So there should be no uh, selection criteria, there should be no selection bias, and the units, they must have an equal chance of being sampled. And now we're going to see that why this random sampling is important, why we're emphasizing that the samples they should have um, um, they, they should have been collected free of bias that all units in the population they must have an equal chance of being sampled so why is this important so first of all we are going to see an example where bias is present for example we are talking about a study which measures the average mass of bank walls right these are small rodents, and the method of catching is using the long worth melon traps. They are baited with grain. So here are the pictures of bank walls and the long worth melon trap, which is baited with grain. So because we want to capture the animals alive, we want to capture animals unharmed. Therefore, we are going to use some traps, and this is one of the traps that can be used in field research, and this trap is baited with grain, right? So this is the study that we are taking as an example here. So what is the study? Study is to measure the average mass of bank walls. So before being captured, animal has to overcome trap shyness because uh, a trap is something new into their habitat and something new into their environment. And that trap is offering them with a food. So uh, obviously they're attracted towards the food but still they have a shyness because this is something which is new in their environment, which is not um, a part of their habitat. So therefore animals have a natural shyness to the new thing. But on the other hand, they're also attracted towards that thing because that thing contains their food. So in order to be trapped, animals first have to overcome the trap shyness, right? Now, the possible threshold for shyness may be lower in hungry wolves than well-fed ones because the bait uh, is food. So the hungry wolves, they might overcome their shyness for the trap earlier as compared to the well-fed wolves. And this is quite natural because the hungry wolves, they might be attracted easily towards the food as compared to the well-fed wolves. So this is a natural element of bias which is present in such type of sampling. And if the hungry wolves are, they have a greater chances of being drawn, and if they are lighter in weight than well-fed ones, so it means that there is an element of bias which is present because the study is to measure the average mass of bank wolves. And if in the sample, there is a large proportion of wolves uh, which are lighter in weight because they are hungry, and because they are starving, so it is going to affect the uh, observations. It is going to be in, uh, affect the information that we are collecting from this population because a large proportion of the hungry or lighter in weight wolves is going to be present in our sample as compared to the wolves which are well-fed and which may be heavier in weight. So in this case, is this sample going to be the true representative of population? Obviously, no. 
So this sample is probably not a true representation of population because there is an element of bias which is present here. Now we discuss another aspect that why random sampling is important because the usual assumption of statistical analysis is that samples are random. So when we do statistical analysis, especially in inferential statistics, so we assume that the samples that we are dealing with, they, are, they have been drawn randomly. They have been taken randomly from the population. So this is the usual assumption of most of the statistical analysis that we do. So if that assumption is false, it means some bias is present, right? So if some bias is present, then that assumption is going to be false. Although we, we will be able to apply the statistical analysis, we will be able to apply the statistical test, but the validity of that test will be lower because it didn't meet the uh, assumption of that statistical analysis. It didn't meet the criteria which is required for the sample to be eligible for that kind of statistical analysis. And hence, this information may not be extrapolated or generalized on population. Because as you were talking about the walls, that if they are trapped um, using their food as the bait, then the hungry wolves, they have a higher chance of being trapped as compared to the well-fed wolves. So this information that we gather on the average mass of wolves from that population that may not be extrapolated or generalized on the population. So it reduces the confidence on estimations which are based on sample data because we cannot take observations from every member of the population and we are relying on the observations that we have taken from the sample. And if sample has an element of bias in sampling, if the sampling was not truly random, then it lowers the confidence on the estimations that on the inferences that we draw from that, that sample and the inferences that we want to generalize over the entire population. So what should we do? If the bias is suspected and you cannot avoid that bias, for example, in this case, because uh, we want to capture animals unharmed and using these uh, traps which have food as their bait, so that is the least harmful way of capturing the animals alive and then releasing them again into the wild. So that is the least harmful way of doing it. But this comes with a problem probable element of bias. So if we are unable to avoid that kind of bias, especially in the field research, it cannot be avoided that some element of bias is almost always going to be present. So if there is an element of bias that is suspected in your study, then it should be acknowledged and it should be discussed in the interpretation of results, right? So this is the right way to do it. So why random sampling is important? Random sampling is important because uh, we want sample to be a true representative of population and we want that every unit in the population, it must have a fair or equal chance of being present in the sample. But if there is some element of bias due to which some specific type of the members from population, they are favored over the others, then that is uh, not going to be a random sampling and the sample is not going to be a true representative of population. And for the statistical analysis as well, we need to have the samples which are random. So that is why this attribute of sampling is very, very fundamental and it is very important if we want to sample for the entire population. So this must be taken into account and every effort should be exercised to reduce uh, any kind of bias which is present in the sampling procedure. And if that element of bias is unavoidable, we should try to minimize it and we should acknowledge that element of bias in our results. And now we are going to discuss another important attribute of sampling and that is known as independence. So what is independence? Independence, being, uh, independence means uh, not being attached to something, not being dependent on something or to be free. So why this, is, why this concept is relevant in sampling and why it is an important attribute of the sampling procedure. So there are many statistical tests that assume that observations in a sample are independent. So independent means that they are not dependent on each other or they are not linked to each other, which means that value of one observation in a sample is not inherently linked to that of another. They are all independent of each other, so they are not linked or they are not dependent on each other. 
and we are going to take the example of the uh, spikelet length from rough meadow grass. So the study is the comparison of average spikelet length of rough meadow grass and uh, they are growing in two different fields. So what we want to do is that we are going to take the spikelet length, we are going to measure the spikelet length from the flowering heads of rough meadow grass and we are going to take these observations from two different fields and then um, there is comparison of their average spikelet length. So this is the study. Now this is uh, the picture of uh, of a rough meadow grass and you can see that this is the spikelet present in a flowering head. So a flowering head is multiple spikelet and this is one of the spikelets in a single flowering head of the rough meadow grass, right? So in the study, uh, we are going to discuss the comparison of the average spike length from rough meadow grass which are growing in two different fields. So the study involves picking up spikelets from the flowering heads of the rough meadow grass plants and measuring their length. So this is the study. So this was our experiment. So we go to the first field and we are able to uh, collect 100 flowering heads and then a spikelet is removed from each of those flowering heads and measured. So how many observations do we have? Now we have 100 observations, right? 100 observations of the spike leaf lengths from first field. Now in the second field, the plant is harder to find and only 80 flower heads were collected. So now you can see that there is a difference in their numbering. And if you want to apply a statistical test that, uh, that involves the equal number of samples from both of the groups, then this is not going to fit in, right? So what we are going to do in that case is, because we need the equal number of uh, uh, equal number of the sample units from both of the samples from both of the groups. So um, a usual thing to do is to make up the number. So an attempt to make up the number is to pick up further 20 spikelet from the same plants from the second field. So you have collected 80 flowering heads from the second field, but you need 100 observations. And because there are multiple spikelets on each of the flowering heads, so it is quite so it seems quite convenient that you are going to take further 20 observations from randomly selecting uh, further 20 flowering heads and taking another spikelet from the same flowering heads. But is this the right way to do it? No, because the observations are not going to be independent, even if the plants are randomly selected, because uh, from those 80 plants, there are at least 20 those plants from which the double observations are taken. Although you are taking a different spikelet from each of those plants, but still that is going to be not independent. They are going to be dependent. How they are going to be dependent? Because there might be some genetic factor that determines spikelet length and that may affect the length of all spikelet from a plant. So if the plant is um, uh, giving you more than one observation, then those two observations are going to be inherently linked. They are not independent because there is same genetic factor of the plant that is affecting their length. So this is not going to be an independent sampling and this is going to distort the sample because in the sample from field number two, there are at least 40 observations that are inherently linked to one another that are present in pairs. All right, so today we have discussed two important um, attributes, two important characteristics of the sampling procedure because we discussed that sample is the true representative of population. So in order to be truly representative of the population, the sample must meet these two basic criteria of sampling. The first one is random sampling, which means that every unit in the population that must have an equal chance of being taken, of being sampled. There should be no element of bias and there should be no group in the population that is to be overrepresented and there should be no group which should be underrepresented in the sample. So every unit in the population is going to be uh, having an equal chance of being sampled. And the other important attribute is independence, that the observations, when the random observations are taken from the population, then uh, they need to be independent from each other. So again, there should be no element of bias 
that um, if you are taking the observations which are inherently linked to one another, so it means that those observations they are going to be uh, represented more in the sample as compared to the other observations. And again, we are going to have an element of bias. So this is going to distort. And if any of these conditions of the sampling procedure, the random sampling or the independence, if any of these are affected, they not just lower the confidence in your estimates that when you want to extrapolate or generalize the results of your sample onto the entire population, so they're not just going to affect those findings or that inference, they are also going to affect the validity of your statistical analysis. Because most of the statistical analysis, most of the statistical tests, they require the samples to be random and they require the samples to be independent. So if these criteria of the statistical analysis, they are not met, then we don't have enough confidence in those statistical analysis. But if somehow there is um, uh, some kind of the uh, element of bias which cannot be completely removed from your sampling procedure, from your experiment, then you should not just acknowledge that or uh, you should also discuss that into your results. That although you are presenting your results, but uh, you, you should say that this was the suspected element of bias that was present in your sampling procedure. So uh, it might affect the validity of your results. So this is the true scientific way of doing it. So uh, whenever you design your experiment and it involves sampling, especially sampling from the field, then you should um, take into account these two basic uh, characteristics of sampling, that the samples should be random and samples should be independent.